I'd like to welcome you, everyone, to the uh, Wildlife Board meeting today. Today is uh, September 21st, 2023, and we'd like to welcome everyone that's in attendance here and, and that's online, and appreciate uh, them being here. If we have to do any visiting, if, if there's anyone that needs to visit or get, bring comments, this, this microphone right here is the one to, one to use. We'll start off with uh, board introductions. We'll start with Kent. Kent Johnson, Southeast Region. Paula Richmond, Southern Region. Bryce Thurgood, Northern Region. I'm Mike Canning. I'm sitting in for Jay Shirley today, who is at an interstate uh, wildlife conference and will be gone for the next few days. Randy Durth, and I'm uh, from the Northeast Region and the, and the Chairman. Brett Selman from the Northern Region. Wade, uh, Wade's online. Will you introduce Wade? Yes, uh, Wade Heaton, uh, Southern Region. And Gary Nelson is stuck in traffic. He will be a few minutes late, but he'll be here in, uh, in just a few minutes, I suspect. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, do our, our uh, rack chair introductions. Let's start with you, Brad. Brad Buchanan, Northern Region. Brock McMillan, Central Region. Eric Luke. Southeastern region. Thank you. Um, let's see, Miles. You're going. Are you? You or Eric? Yes. Going to I'll. I'll. Eric uh, had a kind of an urgent situation arise, so I'll be covering for the Eric on the Northeast region. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kevin Bunnell. I'm sitting in for Austin Atkinson for the Southern region. Austin is still hunting moose in Alaska. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Um. First, we'll call for a vote uh, on the uh, on the approval for the agenda. Is there any modifications or changes to the agen agenda? If not, I'll call for a motion for that. I move we accept the agenda. Second. A motion to accept the agenda was made by Brett, seconded by Kent. All in favor, please raise your hand, those in the room. Wade, I see your hand raised. Thank you. Let's uh, discuss the minutes from from uh, our minutes of August seventeenth, twenty twenty three, our last meeting. Is there any any modifications or changes to those minutes? Call for a vote for to approve those. Motion to accept the minutes. I'll second it. Motion by Kent, second by Brett. All in favor, please raise your hand. I see Wade's, Wade's hand Wade's raised, thank you. Um, well, right now, our, our action log, uh, uh, Gary's not here to talk that, but first I'd like to just visit, or just mention, uh, this past week we, we lost uh, an individual that has been um, in conservation all of his life and really been instrumental in um, in uh, the Utah and other other western western states in conservation, and that's a Miles Moretti. Um, and he spent a ton of time. Oh, you've got him there. Are you ready to talk? Can you talk about him? You know him better than I do. Sure. Um, um, it was very sad for us to learn that uh, Miles passed away over the weekend. Uh, Miles spent uh, 30 years working for the Division of Wildlife, and uh, started as a non-game biologist and became our regional supervisor in Price for quite a long time. And then he became our deputy director. And while he was deputy director, our director, Kevin Conway, had um, very serious cancer and was not able to work. And so for a while there, Miles was our acting director and, and was very influential and made a lot of good um, for hunting at the legislature and, and at the Division of Wildlife. And uh, after he retired, he, from us, he spent another full career working um, for the Mule Deer Foundation, where he was their president and CEO, and um, led a tremendous amount of growth there at MDF, and uh, was very influential, um, not only with big game work, um, for instance, helping with the federal migration corridors policy and, and funding, but he, he really looked at ecosystem um, management and he was influential and part of the Intermountain West Joint Venture Board, which is a board that focuses on wetlands and waterfowl. 
He was influential and, and important in the Sage Grouse Initiative. And uh, I'm really gonna miss Miles. I think uh, many other people will as well. He was um, kind of a giant in Western conservation and also a good friend. And uh, just send our condolences to his family. Thank you, Mike. You did that much better than I could. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn the time over to Mike. Mike now to give the uh, update for the uh, um, DWR. Okay. Thank you, Randy. I think Mike's going to pull up a PowerPoint for me. Okay. So. Um, in our administrative services section, we just wanted to remind everybody um, of some upcoming uh, dates. The next big application period is for sportsman permits. That's gonna start on October 18th and go through November 8th. So make sure you get your applications in there. And also wanted to remind everybody of all the upcoming youth um, upland game and waterfowl hunts. Um, I'm shocked that they start this weekend. Things are, the time is flying and uh, we have chucker and Hungarian or gray partridge hunts uh, for youth this weekend. Northern waterfowl um, hunt starts this weekend and then we've got hunts throughout the fall. So please pay attention to those dates and get your kids out hunting. The aquatic section uh, just wants to remind everybody that fall is an incredibly good time to fish. Fish are hungry and um, actively feeding to put on some, some fat, and I can attest to that. Been out and about this fall, and fish are really biting. Th things have been great this fall, so um, take advantage of that. Um, we have a watchable wildlife opportunity right now in many areas of the state with our kokanee salmon run and uh, kokanee salmon, salmon spawning. And um, most of you have heard of the, um, the Provo Delta restoration project, and that's been very successful. This is the first year it's had water in it. We're already seeing thousands of young June suckers. So that, that's a really encouraging thing. Um, Habitat section is also doing a lot of work in the fall, um, doing, doing lots of um, vegetation manipulation and also getting seed on the ground so that it can be there when we get snow and water throughout, throughout the winter. Um, surprisingly, we had a very light fire season this year, even with all the fuel on the ground. We do have a few small fires that we're um, helping to restore, but that's been pretty minimal this year. And then we're out, um, installing and repairing guzzlers, um, get those ready to, to hold water in the, the spring and summer coming up. In our law enforcement section, um, a very busy time for them. The hunts, the fall hunts are, are when they're, I met their most busy. Um, contacted close to 10,000 individuals in the last month. Um, checked hunting and fishing licenses of over 4,000 people, issued about 500 citations. Um, discovered 173 illegally killed animals. Most of those are fish, but we also had 15 big game animals and some other um, non-fish species. Um, the big item for our outreach section this month was at the Utah State Fair. Um, the State Fair building, um, the Wildlife State Fair building was absolutely beautiful this year. Our staff did a great job. Um, we had over 30,000 people visit. Over 1,000 kids were able to fish, and many of them had never fished before. And, um, this is a great dedicated hunter project. A lot of um, the people helping the kids fish were dedicated hunters, and we really appreciate that. Um, this Saturday is National Hunting and Fishing Day, and so we're offering a promotion at our shooting centers, both at Lee K and at Cache Valley. Um, in our wildlife section, we just wanted to let everybody know, um, I think the board knows we've been um, trying to make the committee process. We have special committees set up a little more transparent. And so we've got a website now that's now active and we're going to um, have information out there saying why the committees are formed, when they meet, um, why they're meeting and who's on those committees. So that's gonna all be out there publicly available and, and easily found. And that's all I've got, Randy. Okay, thank you, Mike. Any, any questions for, for Mike on any of those topics? Okay, thank you. Well, we'll jump into our, our agenda for today. Uh, just while, while uh, our first one is uh, the 2023 to 25 fishing recommendations. While Randy is getting up, we'll uh, just kind of talk about our process. There's some, some green cards up. Uh, Stacy, where are they at? They're on the small table. Um, grab one of those if you want to talk and, and give, give comments. Uh, if you do, you'll get have, have three minutes um, comment period. Um, first, we'll have uh, a, the topic, if there's anything 
from the division of the topic that uh, on the presentation that was online that they'd like to further that we'll ask them to, to do that and then and then there'll be questions from the board uh, questions from the rack chairs and then we'll ask uh, Mike to give us a summary on on the online comments um, and then uh, we'll we'll go on from there so Randy we'll turn time to you yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Randy Opplinger, and I'm an assistant aquatic section chief here at the division. Uh, in addition to the spear fishing regulation changes that were proposed in the presentation that you heard, the DWR would also like to recommend the addition of two new community fishing waters here in the state. The first is uh, Poulter Pond, or sorry, the Pond of Poulter Preserve in West Haven, and the second is a new community fishery in the town of Roosevelt. Both are scheduled to actually open next year, but we're proposing the addition of these two new community fisheries now so they can be reviewed by the RACs and the Wildlife Board through our formal public process. And so the division doesn't have to do any formal regulation change or emergency regulation changes next year when those ponds open. So this means the changes the division is formally proposing for the 2024 fishing guidebook are the spear fishing regulation changes that you heard in our presentation and the addition of those two new community fisheries. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Any questions from the board? I, I appreciate the uh, presentation. Um, any questions from the rack chairs? Uh, Mike, will you give us any online comments that might have been on this topic? Yes, uh, we had um, nine comments on this topic online, seven or 78% strongly agreed with the division's proposal, and two or 22% were neutral. The submitted comments were mostly in support of the proposed spearfishing recommendations and changes to associated administrative rules. Specific comments that were made um, were that these changes to spearfishing will help control invasive species and provide additional opportunity to anglers. One comment suggested that bow fishing should be allowed in the same waters and for the same species as spearfishing. Thank you. Uh, all right, let's start. let's go in reverse order this time. Uh, we'll go and give our, our rack chair reports and motions and and how things voted there. Let's start with Kevin. Will you uh, give us the southeast region? Uh, no, but I'll give you the southern region. Uh, we there was a motion made to approve as presented and it passed unanimously. Thank you, Kevin. Eric. Uh, Southeastern RAC uh, made just one motion, and that was to accept all of the proposals by the division as presented, and that passed unanimously. Thank you. Miles? So Eric Major uh, actually did make it on, so I'll let him report. Okay. You guys hear me all right? At the Northeast region, um, we also made the motion to accept it as recommended and it passed unanimously. Unanimously. Thank you, Eric. Welcome. Thank you. Brock. I was told at the beginning of this meeting we didn't have a quorum, but we did make a motion to pass as presented and it was passed unanimously. I, I think you guys did have a quorum after all. Is that, is that? Yeah. Okay, we're Thank letting you. it go. Yeah, we want to know your. We want to know <laughs> yes, your. Yes, we had a motion to pass as presented, uh, and it passed unanimously. Thank you, Brock. Brad. Uh, the northern region, we had a motion to uh, pass as presented, and that uh, passed unanimously. Thank you. So, in summary, I think uh, all all the uh, all the racks passed it uh, unanimously. Um, we have some we have some comments from the public. Um, Mike, let's start with those. Can you read who the first? Who, and just hand me one, and I'll. First one is uh, Steve Godforson. Yep, come on up, Steve. If you don't mind, come on up. Step this up to the mic here, and and uh, and state your name and and uh, and your your comments. We'll give you three minutes. Mr. Chair, we're not getting the comments from a mic.
We're working on that. Give us just a second. Sorry about that. It's all right. I just want to say good morning to the Wildlife Board. I know that we've got two new members, uh, Kent and Paula. This is a huge honor to be a part of this organization and just, you know, your service. So welcome to, you. if I'm not mistaken, your very first uh, Wildlife Board meeting. I'd like to uh, just say on behalf of the Utah Spiros and the National Freshwater Spear Fishing Association, um, how incredibly impressed we've been by working with the Division of Wildlife Resources. Craig Walker and Randy Opplinger specifically have been the um, just paragon of, of professionalism and listening and helping us with this, um, this process of talking with the Division of Wildlife Resources about how um, spearfishing fits in in the state of Utah. Um, I think half of the board here may remember a year ago, there was a discussion about opening up spearfishing to in waters where um, there were emergency regulations. And by discussing this with the uh, legal team, it was decided that spear fishermen could also participate in, in uh, those emergency regulations. And that's just been a big step. It's just kind of been an understand, um, just a process to, to understand each other. That's been much appreciated. I wanted to follow up with the wildlife board on that. Wanted to just also um, share the perspective that spearfishing is really growing in popularity. You've got shows like Meat Eater, Steve Ranella, uh, was one of the most popular um, television shows about hunting and fishing where they're frequently going spear fishing in their shop on their line online they're selling spear fishing gear other states are expanding their spear fishing regulations the state of Michi michigan just recently expanded spear fishing dramatically for certain game fish um, and i just think that there's a big connection between spear fishing and what a lot of people are looking for today where they want to feel connected to the food chain without an intermediaries and just this opportunity to have a really unique connection with the aquatic environment. And so as much as I'm here today in support of um, the spearfishing changes that are being proposed, I'd like to just ask the board and any of the members that are anyone else that's listening in today to think about um, spear fishermen and spear anglers as not just a niche group that's out there, but as equal peers within the fishing community. I hope that you'll look at us um, as advocates for pristine water and thriving aquatic ecosystems. You'll val value us as, resource, as uh, volunteers. We do a lot of trash cleanup. Um, I hope you'll, you'll see us as uh, an opportunity to be a part of the state's charter to this organization to allow access to more of the state's waterways. This is just another place that um, people can enjoy the state's waters. And then I just say um, that I hope you'll see spear fishermen spear anglers, not just as someone, as a group that can eradicate invasive species, but we would like to be able to take fish home to our families. And we do have a phenomenal opportunity to do that in Utah, but we're not just out there just shooting every fish that we see. We want, in the same way that like, anglers catch and release, people say, well, you can't catch and release if you're a spearfisher. And that's true, but we also are just like any other angler where we only shoot when we're sure, just as these other anglers only take home fish that are meant for home. So um, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to expand access to more waters where we can do that where we'll be seen as um, not just 
let's appease this group and let them go to a, a couple places and fish. But it's like, let's just, exp let's just, let's, let's distribute the angling pressure of spear fishermen more broadly. And then the angling, then the, the pressure is almost non-existent. Um, we're someone, we're a group that brings benefit to the ecosystem and the economies of the state. And just in conclusion, um, I just want to say thank you again for going through this process. The proposals have had overwhelming support. They're very common sense. The vast majority of the anglers surveyed um, accepted, were in favor of the proposals. It was 74 to 100% on all of these proposals. And um, I just look forward to further discussions with the, div the division and on behalf of our group, want to say thank you and ask for your support today. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next will be Ken Strong, and on deck is um, Michael Kennedy. Ken? Ken Strong, representing Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for your service and for what you're doing. Second of all, I would like to applaud uh, the spear fishermen for the marker that they have. That's my biggest fear of hitting a spear fisherman with my boat. SFW has, is in total support of these regulations. We think they're great. Uh, we're glad that the spear fishermen get a chance to do a few things. And so thanks for your time and that's all I have. Thank you, Ken. Okay, on deck now, we're, we'll have Michael uh, Kendi come up and Jeff Salt on deck. Um, I want to thank all the DNR officers that have been working with us um, from Richfield to Randy to out here. We have a lot of neat things that have been happening. I just got back from Spain. I've been there about a month. I represented USA. I made the world championship team. Um, we haven't made the podium since the 60s. The girls took first place last year, third place this year, and one of those girls, Shelby Peterson, from Utah. It's very rare to have someone from Utah make Team USA. Um, the rest of them were Hawaii and Florida. There's four of us per team, and I was one of those three. And uh, we did all right, but uh, pretty tough because France and Spain, they were going down 140 feet shooting fish, and we were going down about 90 feet. So, but... Uh, a lot of things pretty neat about this, though, in, in Utah and spearfishing. The world championship freshwater, New Zealand, um, Africa is the next one that they're proposing. It's been all over. Well, this last year it, it was, or this year it was held here in Utah um, at Lake Powell. And that tells you how big this is getting. We had 13 countries come and participate. The top divers of each country get to have a, a team come and come and compete. We had them from Australia, Africa, New Zealand, um, we, we, all over, but 13 countries. The national championship was about two years ago. That was held again here. That's how good of an area, and it's growing. This sport, the group, and the people are growing. I represent both sides, USA, and what is called the National Freshwater Spearfishing Association. That it, it used to be in Colorado, we brought it here to Utah. I mean, this is how big this is. We, we used to only have about 50 people. We're now at about 150 people. Um, we have a couple tournaments here. One was at Fish Lake. I called the DNR officer, what would you like to happen? Do you want us to shoot the chub there? He said, please don't shoot the chub. Go after the perch. So we have a couple divisions, pro and novice. All right, guys, go after the perch. You get, you get, you can have one trout, you can have as million perch as you want, and suckers. Suckers worth three points, the trout is worth three, and the perch one point each. And they shot hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of perch. How many trout out of over 25 Spiros, and that the rest of us were out of country competing, but out of a lot of them, how many trout shot in five hours? Imagine five hours constantly going down every about two minutes there were only five trout shot in the whole tournament. 
Now you take the same amount of anglers and you have them go out. How many are they going to pull? How many guts are going to be pulled and dropped at the bottom of the pool there? At Starvation, we had a big tournament there called the DNR. What would you like us to do? Would you go after the walleye that are under, I think what they say, 13 inches or, or 10 inches? So they gave big points on the small walleye there. You know, and, and that's kind of neat thing that we do. It's hard to shoot. For me to shoot a fish, I got to be basically for me to him with the glasses there. That's about how close I got I to gotta be to shoot a fish. Some of us pros can shoot further, but it's not shooting every fish. It's really hard to hold your breath, stay down there and shoot fish. But I want you guys to understand Utah is kind of the head in the United States in, in freshwater spearfishing. The rest of the, them get the ocean. We do not, and 70% of the United States does not. And so we're starting, Michigan's open up. I'm hoping to go to Idaho. If you guys know anybody in Idaho, that would help me to open up Idaho. But it's, thank you guys for what you are doing and opening this up to us. I, I get tired of at Prover River. I watch everybody walk out with two buckets of bass and I can't even take one home to my family, you know, cause I don't angle, I, I spearfish, you know, so it's, it opens a lot more opportunity for us and others that are joining this sport. And if you have any questions, let me know. If you need help in any lakes, let me know. I'll get Spiros out there. We'll get looking for whatever you want us to see, video, record, and thank you. Thank you, Michael, um, and congratulations on, on making that team. And, and that was really informational as far as uh, I, I wasn't aware that, that Utah was, was part of the uh, world of countries coming here. So three Floridians. Good job. Congratulations. Okay, uh, Jeff Salt. Morning board members and attendees on the internet and everybody here today. My name is Jeff Salt. I'm the treasurer for the Utah Anglers Coalition. We are a Utah nonprofit organization. We've been around for 19 years and we primarily are a uh, information hub for various angling interests, uh, organizations, retailers, guides, and individuals, and others that are involved in angling industry in Utah. And most of you here and on the uh, online will probably remember that Utah has over 500,000 uh, licensed anglers. So we're a large constituency, and angling, of course, represents a very large part of our economic pro, uh, portfolio in the state of Utah. And we're happy to be uh, you know, an information hub for that industry. Uh, we are in full support of the proposed regulation changes. Uh, we believe that uh, increased spearfishing opportunities in waters and for species where there is no limit and or where catch and kill regulations are in place is appropriate. This action, we believe, will also help to address the problem of illegal species introduction, which is a primary goal for our organization. So we fully support the spear fishermen, and we hope that you'll adopt this rule change. And we did participate in uh, two of the regional RACs and presented the same uh, opinion, and we submitted online comments to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Well, that is our last comment, unless anyone wants to get one in at the last minute. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Uh, uh, you have to excuse me. I need to figure out what I'm doing up here. I guess we're we're to the the point where we we discuss it and then ourselves on the on the board. And and actually, Randy, is there any clarifications you feel is necessary from the DWR on this from Input. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're we're to the uh, board discussion. Mr. Chair, uh, Randy, I just had one question. I guess um, does the division have anything in place? Any plans for monitoring spear fishing? How it's working and what's going on? Are you collecting data on that with the eye of maybe looking at expanding it in the future and seeing what will work and what won't? Yeah, I think definitely we've got an eye on that. Um, you know, kind of what we 
do is every five years we do a survey in collaboration with Utah State University. It gives us an idea of just trends among our angling public here in the state. I think historically we haven't really asked about spearing fishing. The, up the percentage of anglers in the state are participating in spear fishing up until the last time we did the survey, which was really last year. So that's the first kind of data point that we've got on our records on the popularity of spear fishing in the state. And I forgot the exact percent, but it's, it's down around 1% of our anglers participate in spear fishing. So we've got that as kind of a data point for us to track from here, the growth of that sport here in the state and to project the number of anglers in the state that are participating in spear fishing. Really our goal here in the state is to provide angling opportunities in proportion to the number of people or the number of participants in that particular activity in the state. So, you know, we're looking to have spear fishing opportunities in proportion to the number of spear anglers that we've got here in the state. So with that data point, we'll be able to kind of track going forward, you know, changes in the popularity of that sport and give us some idea whether we need to provide additional opportunities for it or not here. Any other questions for Randy? Any, any other discussion on the, this, this item? I just want to say congratulations. That's pretty awesome. Good job on your accomplishments there. And just curious, how long can you hold your breath underwater? I did the one at the pool the other day. I, was, I wasn't even expecting to find it. I just kept sitting down there and it was 425. 425, that's impressive. Um, I appreciate you guys coming, your comments. That helps enlighten us a little bit more. Um, I feel like it's something that's pretty easy to support. Um, I appreciate the athleticism that it takes to do the, the sport, and I just feel like it's something that's pretty easy to say, yeah, it's a good thing to do. Well, if there's no more comments, I'll, we'll uh, entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we adopt the rule changes as presented by the division. Motion by Gary. Second. Second by Bryce. Can, it, can we amend one of them to be looked at like in the river? I don't know if it included that. I like to remind my list that one of the things here is I'm not going to be online. It has to be done in any more ways in order for us to do it. So we've got a motion by, by Gary, um, second by Bryce. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, and Wade's, Wade uh, makes it unanimous. Thank you. Uh, next thing on the agenda is a private pond rule amendments. Uh, Randy, is there any additional information you'd like to present on that? Yeah, I've got a little additional information and also just a background item I wanna point out that I just wanna point out that in our original presentation, we mentioned that we were in the process of working with the Virgin River Recovery Program to identify additional species for stocking in the Virgin River drainage. These would be species allowed in private fish ponds in the Virgin River drainage. Uh, the Virgin River uh, Recovery Program consists of several federal, state, and local partners, and they work towards recovering endangered fishes in that drainage. Uh, since recording our presentation, we've formalized a new memorandum of understanding with the program. And we mentioned in our presentation that it was likely that this agreement would be completed. And under that, we'd propose allowing the stocking of two to four additional fish species as part of this rule change process we're going through right now. Um, as a result of us amending that and uh, coming up with that formal memorandum of understanding, we just want to formally propose those species. I mentioned the presentation really is a placeholder. We're going to come forward with additional species. So the species we would like to propose to allow stocking in the private fish ponds, in addition to the bluegill largemouth bass and uh, rainbow trout that are currently allowed in the Virgin River drainage, are wiper, black crappie, triploid grass carp, and tiger trout. So those are the four additional species that we'd like to propose allowing into private fish ponds. Uh, the other thing I wanna bring up, and this is really an informational item, but there have been some questions in previous RAC meetings about how the DWR introduced proposed amendments to the private pond rule to the state's private aquaculture industry. To clarify, the division did introduce the proposed rule to the private aquaculture industry ahead of the RAC and wildlife board meetings and provided the industry the opportunity to weigh in on the proposed changes. 
We did this by providing an informational at a Fish Health Policy Board meeting. Fish Health Policy Board meetings are public meetings, and they're really the only forum here in the state where Utah's private aquaculture industry uh, gathers to discuss issues going on within the state. As a result, we felt this was probably the best place to propose and discuss this rule change with that industry. Uh, if we go to that meeting, uh, uh, two of the three uh, major private aquaculture facilities here in the state attended that meeting. Neither of them expressed any concerns with the rule, and both were supportive of the rule during that meeting. And since then, we've heard no concerns coming from the private aquaculture industry with regards to the rule changes we're proposing. Thank you, Randy. Can you list those those uh, fish again, That uh, your additional ones, the wipers, and you got the, the yeah, crappie? Yeah, I, I kind of muddled that, but right now into private fish ponds in the Virgin River drainage, people can stock rainbow trout, largemouth bass, and bluegill. We're looking to propose to add to that four additional species, and that's part of this rule change we're proposing here. Those are wiper, black crappie, triploid grass carp, and tiger trout. Tiger. Thank you. Randy, are the black crappie sterile? They're not sterile, but okay. we're looking to propose this in situations really where these would be ponds that are off a natural stream channel that are okay. screened. So, you know, these are very isolated ponds where the escapement risk is basically okay. zero. Okay, other other uh, comments, questions, questions, I guess, from the board. Questions from the rack chairs. Seeing none, we'll we'll go to uh, comments. We've got looks like two comments. Oh, uh, actually, I think we're supposed to do that afterwards. Let's see, uh, Jeff Salt with the Utah Anglers Coalition. Hello again, Jeff Salt with Utah Anglers Coalition. And we're here and we've submitted written comments in support of the rule change. Under the current rule, it is a very difficult rule to read and understand. And I'm a paralegal and I have a hard time understanding and reading the, the current rule the way it's organized. So the first part of this rule change is to reorganize and structure the rule so that it is understandable and palatable by anybody from the public, especially those that are affected um, in the private growing industry. Uh, we also uh, support current triploid testing protocols that the state has in place and we would uh, discourage or oppose any effort by the private industry to use this rule change to eventually uh, weaken the triploid testing protocol. And we've heard that that might be something that they're hoping to accomplish. Um, in addition, we support the expansion of the list of species so that the private growers have more opportunities uh, to expand and to keep their uh, private industry going. We think that, that, that that's a good thing. Uh, we also support the uh, inclusion of the species that have been added to the Virgin River. Uh, we think that that's uh, a good thing. Uh, furthermore, we, we support the inclusion of the language that supports the criminal penalty that's already listed by statute, which makes a violation of the rule a Class A misdemeanor. And by putting it in the rule, it, I think, helps law enforcement in their efforts to make sure that the industry is following the rules. Um, we strongly are supportive of the uh, division's efforts to protect sport fish and native fish populations from escapement uh, from privately stocked fish ponds. And we support protection of sport fish species and native species and conservation efforts that the division is engaged in all over. <clears throat> These are key priorities for our organization. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Ken Strong, SFW. Ken Strong with Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. We support this recommendation. Uh, I have worked, I don't know how many years now with with the, the, the fishing heads in, in the DWR and 
we have worked on this. They have given so much to the private pond things, making it easier for them to get their fish. And, and we're glad that they have done that. They've done a great job. Uh, I think that Utah is, if not the best place in the West to fish, but one of the best places anyway. And it's continually getting better and better. So we support the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Okay, uh, Mike, we'll turn some time to you for the uh, bu online public comments. This will be quick. Uh, we had one online comment and it was in support of the proposed changes. Thank you. And of course, that was just the ones for this particular meeting. We we did have a few comments, uh, not not a ton, but we had a few comments for, for each, each of the, the racks uh, prior to their meetings. And I just wanna let the public know that we do appreciate those. Uh, we read them, we, we review them. And there were some really good things that, that I see that uh, maybe we can do down the road that might not be applicable at this time, but that, that come out of a, a couple of those. So thank you. And with that, we'll come back to uh, discussion on, the, on this uh, item, pond item from the, from the board. Any discussion? I know it's not a real controversial item. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, thank you. I'm supposed to be doing my job. We need rack reports. Let's start uh, uh, with Kevin. We'll, we'll start with you again from, from the Southern region. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. There was a motion made in the Southern region to uh, accept the changes as presented and that passed eight to one in the Southern region. Thank you. Eric? Southeastern RAC had one motion uh, that was to accept all the divisions proposals as presented that passed seven to two, two of the opposing votes. Uh, one of those was not so much in a opposition to the proposals, but the need for more time to evaluate those uh, added proposals. The other was out of concern for the introduction of non-native and non-sterile fish. Thank you. Thank you. Eric uh, Major for the Northeastern region. Let's see. Sorry guys. Um, the Northeast region also um, approved the motion. Unanimously. Thank you, Eric. Brock, Central Region. The Central Region had a motion to accept the recommendations as presented, and that passed unanimously. I don't know if this is the right time. We had another motion, and that motion was to request that the DWR make their presentations for like individual water bodies, like here, the it was the Big Sand Wash Fisheries Management Plan. That generally only the regions that that water body is in, hear those presentations and have an action item. But we had a motion that if it's a destination water body like Lake Powell or Flaming Gorge or Bear Lake, that those get presented to all of the, the racks and they have action on those. And that passed unanimously as well. Thank you, that's probably a great idea. Go ahead, Brad. Uh, Northern Region, we had a motion to approve the private pond rule as presented uh, that passed uh, Eight four with one abstention. Okay, the extent the abstention is that a reason uh, for that? Abstention was uh, being a private pond rule and private property felt oh. there was no intersection with Forest Service. Okay, thank you. All right, um, now we'll jump back to comments. Any any uh, comments or discussion on on this one? We want to make a motion on on uh, the role that uh, the Central did as far as the, the major water bodies, or discuss that. I, I was just wanting to tell Brock, I, I was watching the the racks and I, I really like that suggestion and I think it's a good idea. And I, I really support that. And, and to ask you, Mr. Chair, is, is that appropriate that we make a motion as a board pursuant to that now or is that something that needs to go through the full process? 
Uh, this is the fishing one, so I would I would think now if we if we want to, uh, and you know we we could actually make the, you know make a motion to add it to the action log and ask the division to give us their input on it, and see if you know, maybe, maybe which water bodies might be the the appropriate ones to do it to. I don't I don't know that we have the input now today to say it's Lake Powell, Flaming Gorge, Bear Lake, you know whichever ones they are, but maybe we could ask them. You know, might be appropriate to make a motion to ask them to review it and and. Uh, and bring their feedback to us. So. Okay. Well, are you in the motions now or just the discussion? Yes, if you want to make a motion now, now's okay. a good time. Well, then I presume that I'd like to make a motion that we add that into the action log, have the division look at uh, certain water bodies to, that are destination water bodies and bring that before all of the racks. That good rock? Okay, Stacey, you got that motion? Yeah, in a nutshell, she's got it. Okay, do I have a second on that? Oh, got a second by Gary. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, unanimous here and unanimous with Wade. Thank you. Okay, back to our pond, pond item. I can make a motion we approve the item as presented. That's a motion by Bryce, do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Paula, any discussion? Okay, all in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, here, and Wade. Unanimous again, thank you. Um, thank you, Randy, appreciate that very much. All right, now we'll, we'll go to uh, item number seven, conservation permit audit. Sarah, nope. Yeah, Sarah's going to, Sarah Scott's going to uh, uh, present that for us, I think, with Kenny's support. Nope, Thank Kenny, you. Kenny's going to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I noticed I was on the agenda this week, and so I told Sarah I'd give her a break, and she could just have my back. Okay. <laughs> so, appreciate it. Thanks, uh, board members, rack chairs, and members of the public. I have a few slides, and Mike's going to help me navigate through them. Uh, and it, it's just a brief presentation. The, the audit, I think it's worth noting, uh, the process and the, and the administrative procedures that we have in place have made this so simple and clean. And one of my favorite things to do is, is to see this come together and, and look at the long list of projects that you all got to review in the packet. Um, Super impressive, the stuff we can do from, from this program. Appreciate the groups and, and all, of, all of their help and their staff to, to help us work through this. So just a quick history. A small percentage of permits are awarded to our conservation partners. Uh, and then those permits uh, bring in critical revenue for wildlife and habitat for, for projects on the ground. Our project or our, our partnerships are, are super critical to us for a lot of reasons, not just the funding, but also the the support on the ground and the, and the manpower in the field to make a lot of this happen. And so um, that, that's worth, worth noting. Mike and I were trying to work out our baseball signals to switch slides. This year, 312 permits were awarded to our partners, which is less than 2% of the total of all permits. Uh, they were mar marketed and auctioned off uh, to maximize their return for wildlife. And this year they generated $7.6 million in in revenue. So like we've talked about, the revenue is used to fund division approved conservation projects and it's broken down in these percentages. 30% of the total is returned straight to the division. 60% is retained by the groups uh, for division approved projects. So that's that's the process. They, they get permission to, to do those projects by the division. And then the groups keep a, a modest 10% to help cover their administrative overhead. And, and this time of year during the audit, they definitely, they definitely earn it. They, they help us a lot. So uh, next slide, please, Mike. So the audit really looks at a, just four, four things. Uh, we make sure that the expenditures for projects were approved by the division before any of the work starts. We look to make sure that the funds are kept in a separate and federally insured bank account and that the permit price is recorded at the banquets match what gets reported by the groups. 
and that any of those invoices are paid on time and, and project revenue is expended in the appropriate year. And all that was really, was really clean this year and we'll look a little closer at it here in just a couple of slides. So specifically, we, we looked at 171 permits to compare the auction price with what was reported. Uh, we didn't see any issues with that at all. They were all spot on. We ran an exceptions report that, that kind of looks at the price year to year to, to look for fluctuations and there was no disparities in, in that report as well. Next slide, Mike. And then with the pre-approval project or process 100% compliance uh, this year, all the funds were verified in separate and, sec and secure bank accounts. There were a couple of small housekeeping items that, that we ran into. You know, we take a, a snapshot of the, of the, of the calendar year. So, some of those transactions on either end, the small little bits of, of interest and, and bank account fees, um, we, we just adjust those. And so there were a couple of those unreconciled at the completion of the audit and, and they've all been taken care of since. Uh, one thing to note, SFW overpaid its 30% by that $1,200. And this group might remember it was because of a, a I think it was a Ponsagant bull elk permit that, that was uh, reduced from their, from that total. Um, so yeah, this year, everything was great. The, the, the compliance with the August 15th deadline uh, was, was met 100%. Uh, if, if the organizations had any permit proceeds that weren't deposited at the time of the audit, they just need to ensure that that happens and that has been taken care of. Any accrued interest, as a reminder, should just be left in the account, uh, and they're really, really small amounts, and, and they get applied to projects for, uh, to the funds remaining for projects. Uh, and then anytime the bank fees exceed interest, uh, those bank fees minus the interest should come out of the group's 10% or just be covered by a deposit. So really minor, minor things. And then uh, lastly here, this is just the overall view of that revenue. You can see the groups on the left there. Uh, and then their carryover project revenue from last year is that kind of second column from left. All the new project revenue for, for 2023. And then interest and donations uh, in that middle column which gives us our total for all the project revenue available uh, minus expenditures. And then that gives us our, our verified bank account balances for, for next year. And uh, I'm sure you've all had a chance to look at that. So I think with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Kenny. I just got one question. I, if, I believe I'm correct, but uh, if, if, if a tag, if a tag is, um, is auctioned off for um, a bison, does it that money go towards a bison project? Or if it's auctioned off towards a mule deer, it goes towards a mule deer type habitat type project. Is that is that correct? That is more or less how it works, yep. And, and a lot of those projects will they benefit overlap. multiple species, but yeah. Thank you, other questions for Kenny? All right, thank you. Uh, do we have any, we do. We've got uh, um, this, this. This did not go through the racks, am I correct on that? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Troy Justice said, well, that, have you come up? We got a comment from, public comment from Troy, SFW. Good morning. Troy Justinson, Sports and Fishing My Life. Brock, next time I'm going to ask for a demonstration, see if he can actually hit you with the spear from right here. I worry. No, I just want to express um, my appreciation and gratitude. Sorry. I'm not supposed to cry until later, but uh, for the opportunity to participate in the conservation permit program. It's a huge benefit to our organization. I think we do a great job and a great partners. We're working with other conservation groups in the division and picking projects and following through and getting things done that actually benefit the average Joe. So 
thank you for allowing us to participate in this. I had the best job in the world. I get to meet and work with some amazing people. But days like this, it gets a little tough when you have to say goodbye. Miles Moretti was not only a great partner, he was a great friend. I'm so grateful. for the opportunity I had to work with him, to learn from him, to have him as a mentor. Miles, you will be missed. I love you, brother. Julie, our heartfelt condolences go to you and your family. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. And I, 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 I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the notice and the uh, recommend, uh, the information you put out on all, all your SFW members on on that. That was well written and and uh, it's hard. Thank you. All right. Uh, the, we so we did not have any online comments on this one. Correct. So we'll just jump back jump into uh, board discussion. Any questions or comments that on this audit? Yeah, one thing that's kind of unique here in Utah, and, and most people in this room already know it, is just the fact of the money we have available to do projects. You know, other states are scrambling. I know I've looked at Idaho's numbers, and and they 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 grovel for funds to do projects with, and and for us, it's not a problem. I think that's that's fantastic because it enables us to improve habitat, you know, improve water sources, do things that benefit not just the the game animals but all animals. I think it's a good thing. It is. Yeah, we have the opportunity to go to other to meetings, we'll meet other uh, states commissioners, and uh, you know, we're we're Utah. Only about eight percent of the uh, the funds that to to deal with the wildlife comes from the um, from state budget, and where others, um, it's about opposite. It's about over ninety percent comes from it. To, but we're able to do these projects because of um, of pro programs just like this. So it, it is a really good thing, in my opinion. Mr. Chair, Wade, uh, I just want to weigh on this as well. I. I agree with your comments. Um, there's been criticism of this program. <clears throat> Let's be honest. A lot of people feel like it <clears throat> it departs from the North American model of wildlife, and and I guess in some part it does. But <clears throat> there can be no denying the good that comes from this program and what it does. And, and I've always offered to those that have criticisms of the program. I've always offered. Uh, come up with another way uh, to provide these kinds of funds <clears throat> that can go in for habitat projects and, and do all the good that this does. And, and certainly that new suggestion will get looked at. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, this is the best we've come up with so far and, and it is serving us well and serving the purpose well. So I, I still feel like this program is a win, uh, even though it does have some criticism. Thank you, Wade. Other comments? I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I, I would move that we approve the uh, conservation permit audit as presented. Thank you, Wade. Motion by Wade. Second. Second by Kent. Any discussion? We'll call for a vote and all in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five here and Wade, it's unanimous. Thank you. And thank you, Kenny and Sarah. Uh, item number six, eight is our conservation permit annual audit. And I think Rusty's going to represent Covey while he's out of the country. 
That's right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, Rusty Robinson. I'm the once in a lifetime coordinator. And yeah, Kobe's traveling to an out of state meeting. So we'll excuse him today. <clears throat> um, I'll be presenting on the conservation permit program annual report, which if you haven't uh, heard the, the origin story of, of the conservation permit program, it's, it's kind of a neat story. And by the way, I, I encourage um, anyone to to go online and, and read the, the annual report. It's, it sounds like it'd be boring. It's actually a pretty good read. It, it tells some stories and it's kind of cool. But um, it, it all started in the 1980s with desert bighorn sheep. Um, the division had a dilemma where we had an overly dense population of, of bighorns around canyon lands. And conversely, we had a lot of open sheep habitat in Southern Utah that was not filled with, with sheep. And so, um, the dilemma is we needed to move some sheep and, and needed some funding and some real forward thinkers um, dreamed up this novel idea that we could auction off a permit and, and use that funding to, to um, support transplants. And from that, we were able to move bighorns from Canyonlands all over Southern Utah, um, San Rafael, North and South, Kaparowitz, the Escalante, the Henry Mountains, uh, a couple other places. And it was really uh, a success. And from there, a, a star was born, and, and the program's really developed into what it is today, um, where it's, it's um, very successful, it's transparent. Um, it's regulated by Utah Administrative Rule R657-41. And to date, it's generated more than $80 million for wildlife conservation um, well, since 2001. There's a look at <clears throat> the number of conservation permits that are issued by year. Um, they're issued on a, uh, or calculated on a three-year cycle and, and approved by the Wildlife Board. The, the reason for the annual fluctuations there is uh, as we change the way we manage things, as, as um, the number of permits uh, changes in the public draw, then the number of conservation permits change. And, and so I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the tail doesn't wag the dog. Um, how we manage determines uh, the conservation permit uh, not not the other way around. So if we're able to uh, to uh, provide more permits in the public draw, then we're able to issue more conservation permits and and vice versa. So it's it's all uh, calculated and spelled out in the rule how that's determined. Um, <clears throat> here's a list of the participating conservation organizations in 2023. There were nine of them: the Mulder Foundation the National Wild Turkey Federation, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Safari Club International, Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife, Utah Sar Archery Association, Utah Houndsman Association, Utah Wild Sheep Foundation, and the Wildlife Conservation Foundation. And these are a lot of names of groups, but, but more than that, these behind these groups are a lot of uh, very dedicated and, and committed and passionate individuals. And um, on behalf of the division, we just want to uh, personally say thank you for all that you do uh, in our, our wildlife conservation efforts. Um, through these groups and through these individuals, we're able to all push the boulder uphill together and, and really do some neat things. And so from the bottom of our hearts, we want to say thank you to them. There's a lot of individuals that that spend countless hours and, and energy and time away from their families traveling and, and they do a lot of good. So just thank you again. Here's a look at the, uh, <clears throat> the funds that have been raised through the years through this program. Um, overall, a, a steady increase throughout the years. Um, from 1980 to 2000, raised about two and a half million dollars. And since then it's, it's increased to what it is today in 2023. Um, we're able to, to raise $7.6 million uh, for wildlife conservation through this program. And really that's, that's just a fraction um, uh, because this program, as we, as we allocate these funds to different programs, a lot of times we're able to leverage that money against uh, federal excise tax, Pittman-Robertson money, and who provides a, uh, a lot of times a 75% match. A lot of times we can um, put this into habitat projects where other groups match as well. And so often this money gets quadrupled or even more. And so it's a, it's a huge benefit to wildlife. Through this funding, uh, we're able to do a lot of, a lot of cool projects. 
Um, and, and Utah is really at the forefront in the West and, and even in the country as far as our, our capturing efforts, um, our habitat efforts, and um, our cutting edge research with the help of our conservation partners and our, our university partners in BYU and, and Utah State. Um, we're able to capture a lot of animals and, and, and collect a lot of um, informative data. This year alone, we captured and collared 1,276 big game animals, including 63 bighorns, 30 bison, 817 mule deer, 360 elk, and six mountain goats. Wanted to highlight a couple of the, the bigger projects we have going on as well. Um, we, we embarked on a, a project on the LaSalle and San Juan, um, where we're we're capturing and collaring uh, neonates. And so uh, this June, we captured 100 newborn fawns and put collars on them. And we're able to uh, track survival on those, those neonates from, from zero to six months old. And then, um, and then in the future, those does and fawns will be, will be tracked. And as we, um, if a mortality is suspected, biologists can go in and investigate and determine the cause of death and it really drives the way we, we manage deer on those units. We also uh, captured 125 cow elk on a, a elk movement study in Southern Utah. This is a, a look at the, the complex of six units there, the Boulder, the Fish Lake, Monroe, uh, Dutton, Ponsagant, and Thousand Lakes. And we know there's a lot of um, elk or there's some elk interchange between those units. And so this study will really give us a thorough understanding of the, the timing, the magnitude, and how predictable that movement is. And it really allows us to manage at the appropriate uh, geographic scale. We also have, uh, have done a lot of habitat work with these funds. And in, uh, <clears throat> this year, we were able to treat uh, 42,000 acres with conservation permit funds. That's about 65 square miles. Um, we're able to complete 37 watershed rest restoration initiative projects and, um, and, and start a number of other projects. And, and you can see the, the number of projects that benefit each species there. And there's a lot of spillover as well. Um, a, a project that benefits mule deer also benefits a number of other species, sage grouse, et cetera, in a lot of cases. We wanted to highlight three of the, some of the bigger habitat projects that we've been working on. Um, the first one is the Mahogany Ridge Bullhog Project, and that's um, a project up near Hardware Ranch. <clears throat> we've uh, uh, masticated a lot of juniper, we've done some aerial seeding, we've planted shrubs. It's kind of an all-inclusive project that benefits deer, elk, moose, and, and sage grouse. We also been working on the 12-mile watershed restoration project by Mayfield. <clears throat> this is about 1,400 acres, um, chaining, lop and scatter, bull hog, um, able to treat some, some oak brush and, and increase some stand diversity and just do a lot of good work on that one as well. And the last one is the Upper Provo Watershed Restoration Project. It's about 1,300 acres. Um, again, a lot going on, juniper oak mastication, um, wood thinning of conifers, and clear cut to promote aspen growth. So again, um, just ways that we use this funding to, to benefit wildlife. Just again, I wanna uh, thank again all our partners. And, and there's really a, a silent partner here the, that often gets overlooked and that's just the average everyday public hunter of Utah. Um, they're the ones that sacrifice a few of these permits and their public draws. <clears throat> And that's not lost on us. We strive to, to uh, take these, these permits and this funding and multiply the benefits and really give it back to the public hunter in the form of healthier populations, better quality, more opportunity. And so I just wanted to say thank you to them. And we're proud of this program, it's successful, and we hope others see the benefits as well. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Rusty. Uh, I've got a question. Yeah. On your slide there, it showed that um, from 2020, 2020 to 2023, we had about a, went from about 5,000 to 75 or seven, or from 5 million to 7 million five or so, 7 million eight. Um, that big jump in, in uh, revenue, yeah, right there. 
you know, each year it's getting more. What is causing that? What, what, what do you think is causing that? The, I, I think initially in 2020, there was a big jump with COVID and it's, and it's just kind of multiplied since then. I, I don't know if I have a, a better answer, um, but there's just a huge demand for, for on the resource for, for hunting and, and for wildlife. And, and as permits get harder and harder to get across the West, then this, I think this program is only gonna, gonna be more successful. Yeah, just just surprising that some of these permits sell, you know, so much more than they did the, the previous year. Or so, other questions by board. Okay. Comments. Discussion. I do just want to second um, Rusty's comment about how. Each organization is fueled with passionate people. And I've just in my involvement in the past 25 years in conservation, I can second that, that a lot of the organizations, their number one priority and goal is to help wildlife. And it shows, I feel like, in the way that they do it. And especially the DWR personnel and all the work that they put into that. So thank you very much for your efforts there as well. Rusty, I think it was a nice touch you, 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 how you added the uh, the public hunter in there, the normal normal Joe, because they do give up these tags, but they get so much more back by by this these these funds going into this, and now that all the habitat work and all the restoration work, every, everything everything goes done. It's just you know we we've got a really good thing going in the state with that, and I I do appreciate that nice touch. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion that we approve the conservation permit annual report as presented. Second. We got a motion by Paula, second by Bryce. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Raise your hand and I, it's unanimous here and Wade, thank you. Thank you, uh, Rusty. And uh, we'll move on to action item number nine with Stacy Coons presenting our 2024 rack and board meeting dates. Thank you, Chairman. I am Stacy Coons. I do coordinate the wildlife board um, and I'm here to present the dates for 2024. So we're keeping them pretty similar to this year. We did manage to keep this meeting out of the opener of the muzzleloader hunt. So for those of you heading out to the hills next week, good luck on that. Um, there's not any changes, any significant changes to the calendar next year other than um, our RAC meeting starting times have all been adjusted. And we started with this last cycle. They will all start at 6 now. And um, we had a couple that started at 6.30, but for consistency, we have moved them all to six. Um, I do want to give the board a reminder that the upcoming RAC tour, your meeting was originally scheduled for November 30th. However, due to winter WAFWA being moved from January to the end of November, we have had to move that meeting from that Thursday to the previous Tuesday. So your board meeting will be on November 28th, which is a Tuesday and it will be held here. Um, it is what we typically call the big game board meeting. Um, so it will be a little bit longer than the meeting today. So, sorry, Brett. Um, but in changing that meeting, because winter WAFWA is no longer the first week of January, your meeting that was previously scheduled for January 2nd, which was a Tuesday to accommodate for board members flying out of town, will now move back to the Thursday of that week. So that one is moved back to January 4th. Um, I will send you all a confirmation email on these and throw them on your calendars. So with that being said, there is no additional changes. We did add a work session again in April. That one is on April 9th, which is also a Tuesday. Outside of the meetings that I've discussed, the rest of them all fall on a normal Thursday. Um, if there's any questions about your schedule, I'd be happy to chat about it. I, I think Stacy's right. Uh, the RAC members and board members better eat your Wheaties before we go into the that November round. There's a lot, a lot on that one, I think. Um, 
Do we have those dates published anywhere? Um, once you guys approve them today, they will go on the RAC board page on our calendar, on our website. Okay. So yes, the public will have access to all of the RAC dates and the wildlife board meeting dates. They will also have a list of tentative agenda items. Um, I wanna emphasize that those are tentative. Those items tend to get moved around on a couple of the racks. So they'll always wanna check the official agenda for that meeting. But that, that is available to the public. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right, call for, for a motion. I move that we accept the, the rack and board meeting dates as presented by Stacy. Thank you, Brett. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Second by Gary. Any discussion? Okay, I'll uh, ask you to raise your hand. I'll call for a vote. All in favor? See Wade's, Wade's up and it's unanimous in this room. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. And thank you, uh, all those on the, on, online. I appreciate you being there, Wade, Miles, Eric, Kevin. I'm sure I'm going to butcher it. So thank you for for that. And those that are watching, appreciate you taking the time out of your day to to, to watch this. And board members, any other any other items we need to discuss today that are not on this? Did you uh, bring up the act, the old business and action log, when Gary arrived? Oh. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that, uh, Gary. I, I, would you? Uh, is there anything on the action item list that we did not cover earlier? Yeah, just a couple items, and this is mostly information-wise. Um, we had a couple of things that's that have been recurring, and that was the two-pointer smaller buck tackle for youth, and. Uh, we, we actually addressed that in a work meeting and you can find the minutes online if, you're, if you need to do that. Randy and Brock presented some pretty compelling data about, about how many of the two points are left or how many of the yearling bucks are left after a year. And the survival rate made it, made it uh, kind of an interesting, interesting thing. But anyway, the dick, we've got, we kind of slid that over to the deer committee when they handle it, when they make the deer plan, they're gonna talk about that just a little bit more. Um, a good portion of the yearling bucks die anyway, just from being stupid among other things and you know, their behaviors. And so it's, I know they, they felt like that was squandering deer that could otherwise be shot by especially beginner hunters. Um, then we had um, another one that was the youth only deer permit program. This was also handled in the work meeting. Um, and we look, looked at it kind of closely and, and people wanted to like a similar to the dedicated hunter program except for youth. And, and so it was brought to attention that, that they already have that. They can already participate in the youth um, dedicated hunter program if they want. Um, they still get all of the perks that youth get. They get 20% of the tags right off the top, and then they get to get put in again to get it again. They have a reduced fee. And so that was kind of a, a non-issue as well, even though it was on the action log to do it. It was available, and and if I, I think I'm correct, a lot of the uh, youth hunter um, dedicated options went un unclaimed. There was quite a few that didn't even get used. We've got a couple of others coming up that we're gonna deal with in November, but that concludes this one. Thank you, Gary. Any uh, questions on, on those two items? Thank you, Kent, for reminding me about that. Forgot about that we, we need to circle back and catch that, that item. Um, anything else for today? If not, I'll call for a motion to Close this meeting. So moved. Motion made by Kent, second. Second by Brett. I heard it, I heard a whisper down there. All in favor, raise your hand. And Wade's Wade, appreciate that. All right, we'll call it, we'll call it closed.